Hey everyone, welcome back to another chess video. This one's going to be on one of my favorite games of chess that I've ever seen. And it's between Donald Byrne and Bobby Fischer. So you might have heard of this game. It's called the Game of the Century. And it really is a beautiful game. So Bobby Fischer, if you don't know, is one of the one of the greatest chess players of all time. Really prominent figure in chess history. And this game will just show you why he's such a such an amazing player. Uh, Donald Byrne is an, it was, at the time of this game, an international master. A really strong player in his own right, so he represented the states in, a couple, in several Olympiads, different things. Uh, just a really, really strong player as well. So, what's really impressive about this game, though, was that it was played in 1956, so it's when Bobby Fischer was only 13 years old. So, he was by no means the favorite going into this game, and he had not yet reached the, the peak of notoriety and fame that he, has achieved, he achieved later on in his life. But still, even at this time, at, even at age 13, he was a phenomenal player with incredible control over over the chessboard. So I hope this game demonstrates that for you, and hopefully you'll see just why this is such an amazing game. So Donald Burns with the white pieces, and Bobby Fischer's playing with the black pieces here. So we open up with knight f3, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7. So we have the English opening on the board. Uh, then we go with d4, so we, trans we transpose into the king's Indian defense. And now we go with, uh, Bobby Fischer goes ahead and castles. We have bishop f4, and now with d5 we go into the Grunfeld defense. And there's a lot of different things you could play in this position. So Donald Byrne goes with queen b3. It's nothing fancy, it's still standard theory. We see an exchange in the, we see an exchange here. So d takes c4, queen takes c4, and now we go with, uh, we go with c6. So c6, the idea behind that, of course, is, is twofold. So firstly, this pawn is under attack here with uh, the bishop and the queen. Whoops. The bishop and the queen eyeing down on the c7 pawn. And by playing c6, he eliminates that threat, but also prevents the knight from coming to b5 and trying to do anything sneaky on the c7 square. So two different defenses, two, two different good reasons for that c6 move. Then we have e4, again, just pushing for more central control. Knight b to d7, so getting that knight developed. He can't move it to c6, of course, so he gets it to d7 instead. Um, and then we have rook d1, a really nice move because it, it strengthens this d4 pawn and also potentially moves in for a d5 thrust. And also just if this pawn were to move, you have a nice open file for your rook. Then we have knight b6, so he's moving with tempo. And what this means is this knight b6 move, it, it's developing, but also it moves with tempo. So white has to now deal with this threat and his queen, and in that time, black can, you know, do something else. So he gets a little extra, he gets an opportunity to do something else. So moving with tempo. So now we see queen c5, just getting his, uh, moving his queen out of danger, and now bishop g4. So this is a really nice pin because unlike in previous situations we've seen where the queen is on d1, and, you know, this move doesn't have as much venom then, because the rook is, because it's a rook on d1, if white were to play, say, h3, if the bishop could now capture on f3, and now white would be forced to take back with the g pawn, and this was, this is really bad for the pawn structure, right? Because now white already cannot castle queenside because he's moved the rook, so now if he were to castle kingside, this would be a terrible defense for his king, because this, this pawn structure is just so terribly damaged, and this f3 pawn is now right, these f3 and f2 pawns are now right targets for, for black later on in the game. So, not ideal. So, that's why bishop g4 is particularly strong here. And now white plays bishop g5. So this is a move that's been criticized a lot because you know, it doesn't do very much. The idea, of course, is ideally if if this knight were to move, then you have this really nice attack on the e7 square. Um, but even then, that's only if the knight moves. I suppose there's this option of maybe playing e5 later on, forcing the knight to move. But But even then, what this really fundamentally neglects is that now the white king is stuck in the center for longer, right? Because ideally you could have used this opportunity to play something like bishop e2, and this would be fine because not only do you liberate the pin, but you also give your king a chance to castle. So that would get your king to safety, and you know this game would continue. But by playing bishop g5, which actually happened in the game, you kind of no longer have the option to castle and get your king to safety, and so this gives Bobby Fischer some nasty, um, nasty uh, opportunities here. So. The first real punch he strikes is with a really creative move, knight to a4. So this looks weird because firstly it puts the knight in a very 
unideal square. You don't, usually don't want your knights on the rims. But what it also does is basically it sacrifices the knight seemingly for free because this knight is not defended here. I uh, Donald Byrne could easily come in and snap that up if he wanted. But there's a couple of other threats here that Fisher is really looking at. So firstly, he's looking at this e4 pawn, right? Because this e4 pawn is currently pretty weakly defended. It's only defended by the knight. And secondly, this e4 pawn opens up a road to the white king, who's still, like we mentioned, very exposed on e1, right? There's not a lot of great defense he has. So therefore, he's saying, all right, let's get this knight off c3, because then we can launch a nice attack through e4, which we can eventually use to break open uh, break open white's king side, all right? So that's the idea behind playing knight to uh, a4. Because now if you capture here, you can just go capture here. And also, this also opens up a fork on the knight and the bishop, so there's so white's in a bit of a rumble there. So Donald Burns sees this, and so proactively he plays queen a3. He does not accept the, he does not accept the sacrifice. He plays queen a3 to, to guard this knight at least, to guard this knight for a while. And also just to potentially just you know, try and kick this knight back if he want if he if he if it stays there. So Fisher continues his plan. He grabs the knight on c3. So we see b takes on c3. So this gives White a slightly better pawn structure here now in front of the king. And he just carries on with his plan. He goes knight takes on e4. And this now uh, it's it's a move with tempo as well because he's attacking the white bishop on g5. So he has to react to that. And the bishop is not. You can't just leave the bishop there because the knight is pinned. It's still pinned to the whoops, it's still pinned to the rook on on d1. So if if uh, white were to capture this bishop, this knight would not be able to capture back without losing the rook. So that's still so there's, so there's still some threat here. So Donald Byrne continues with bishop takes on e7, just carrying on with the with the uh, what he what he planned earlier. And Bobby Fisher goes with queen b6. Now right now it's not quite right to capture the rook because if you go if you do that you can capture with the bishop. And now the queen has to move, and then once the queen moves, you can still come in with knight takes on c3. And again, it opens up this really, it opens up this file for the rook. And of course, there's also even you know, ideas like bishop b4 check that could come up in the future. So just, and that's also just discounting this bishop still pinning the rook. So lots of other threats. So not great for white to capture that right now. So in this position, uh, he plays bishop c4. So just. Again, recognizing just that his king is really exposed here, and that also hinders some of the attacks he might have. So he just tries to go ahead and just say, all right, let's get this king castled, and then we can reevaluate from there. So at this point, um, Bobby Fisher carries on with knight takes on c3, and you can't grab this knight here on c3 right away, even though it does look like you could, because then you have a rook e1, and this, this bishop is not defended. So you can't just castle away your king, you have to, um, you, you know, have to, you'd have to do something like queen a3, but even that would not work because then you have something like queen to c7, or even bishop f6, or even something like bishop f6. Both of those would easily win the bishop, so you can't, you, you would lose that way. And if this bishop were to fall, your your rook has this nice open line of attack on your king, so it's not great. So, White comes up with a slightly more creative attack here. So he doesn't take the knight. Instead, he goes with bishop c5. So what this does, he says, he recognizes, yeah, I need to get my bishop out of there before I can take this knight. So he brings it to c5 with tempo again, saying, all right, now you have to get your queen to safety, and I'll use that extra time to come here and grab this knight. Right? So that's what he does there. And now Bobby Fisher does one thing, does a few things. So firstly, he plays rook e1, rook e8 check, excuse me, uh, just forcing the king to move. So he gets the king to f1. And now he plays what's considered to be the move of the century. If you consider this to be the game of the century, this is considered to be the move of the century. Just a really, really beautiful move. That's bishop to e6. Now, this is an absolutely stunning move just because, well, you know, it's easy enough to sacrifice your queen, but to be able to see all the ensuing calculations behind it is even more impressive because if, you know, white tries to be sneaky and does something like bishop takes on e6, still attacking the queen, still attacking the queen and also attacking this knight here, then you have the absolutely crushing move that's queen b5 check. The king cannot come to e1 here because this is just checkmate. So he has to go back to g uh, to g1. Then you have knight e2 check, king f1. And then you have knight g3 check. This is a pattern we call smothered mate, and this is how it often comes about. Really, really beautiful pattern. The king, once again, cannot come to e1 because queen e2 is just checkmate. 
has to go back to g1. Then you have a queen sacrifice. Queen f1 check. Rook captures. That's checkmate. Really, really beautiful combination there. So he can't... There's so there, it's, Even though he's giving up the queen, it's almost like there's just not a lot of other great options for white. Even if well, even if black does not accept the queen sacrifice, just not a lot of great options. So he grabs the queen. And again, Donald Burns knows this is... There's Bobby Fischer probably has something in the works, but he figures, you know, at least if I have this material advantage, I can maybe work to sort of simplify things to as we go on, maybe I can survive this. And now Bobby Fischer begins really piling on the pressure. He goes, Bishop takes on c4, opens an attack on the king. It's a check on the king, and you can already see this rook on e1 is just so strong, controlling this entire e file, so the king cannot come out this way. It has to go back to g1. Then we have knight takes knight to e2 check so now we see the start of what's called a windmill another really pretty chat uh, tactic in chess that uses discovered attacks so the king comes to f1 and now wherever this knight goes you'll have a discovered check from the bishop so the knight is free to pursue its own evil goals while the bishop is still checking the king and white has to react to that so knight comes and grabs on d4 with check again this, op this opens up the file for this bishop this opens up this bishop to control this opens up for this bishop to control this entire uh, let's see, well, that's not it. This entire dark square diagonal here, which is makes it really powerful. King cannot again cannot come to e1, so he has to go back to g1. So once again, we come back with knight e2 check. King goes back to f1, and now you come with knight c3 check. You're gonna win the rook because again, white cannot move the rook because it's check. And king uh, goes back to goes back to g1, but white does not capture immediately. He goes with a captures on b6 first. Again, this is a move with tempo because white has to now react to his queen under attack from this rook on a8. So white goes with queen to b4. Again, just maybe trying to win this bishop in exchange for the rook. Fisher does not allow this. He goes with a really nice rook a4. Again, just not. he's protecting his bishop. The knight, again, cannot be captured because this bishop like we talked about, this bishop on g7 now controls this entire diagonal, so the knight is protected. Now the queen just comes here on b6, grabs this pawn here, and now, and only now, does Bobby Fischer come in and grab this rook on d1. So, beautiful pattern going on here. So he just used, he's just absolutely, even though he sacrificed his queen, this position is absolutely winning for black, because there's just, the white queen is, yeah, he has a queen, but this is just so... The white, pe all the black pieces are just functioning so efficiently. There's very little that the queen can do at this, po at this point. So, to give us at least give his king a little bit of leeway, Donald Byrne plays h3. Again, of course, this rook to excuse me, this rook to e e1 check is a threat if this knight were ever to move. So, that's 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 it. there's the arrow. <laughs> so this rook to e1 check is still a threat if this knight were ever to move. So just to eliminate any nasty possibility of that happening. He just goes rook h3, he goes to pawn to h3 just to give his king a little bit of breathing space. Now we see rook takes on a2, getting a rook on the second rank, which as we've discussed is a really powerful thing to have. King goes to h2, just retreats away here, uh, and also opens up this rook to attack this knight on d1. We see knight takes on f2, gets the knight to safety, also puts another attack on this rook. Rook goes to e1, so we see a trade of rooks here, uh, rook captures on d1, queen d8 check, bishop f8, and knight captures on on e1. And now we see bishop d5, giving this bishop a really strong outpost here because it's defended by the pawn. The pawn and the bishop defend each other, so this is very difficult to break. And also this opens up a really nice line of attack on this g2 pawn, very, very close to the king, very dangerous indeed. And of course, this rook is also going to come in at any point and also attack with a with a, also join that attack. So this will be very, very dangerous for white. So he goes knight f3, Donald Byrne goes knight f3, just trying to get this knight into the action and also temporarily blocking this bishop's view of g2. See knight e4, getting this knight out of the way, just open up for the rook. We see queen b8, maybe targeting this b7 pawn, just trying to get something. And now Bobby Fischer plays b5. And at this point, it's really fun to notice that every one of Bobby Fischer's pieces is defended. So this this bishop here does a great job defending the rook on a2, the bishop on, uh, you defend the knight on uh, e4, defends the c6 pawn, the c6 pawn in turn defends the bishop and the b5 pawn, uh, the f7 and the h7 pawns defend the g6 pawn, king defends all three of these pieces here, and if we want to just, just want to connect everything for fun, the bishop also defends the f7 pawn. So 
Bobby Fischer's pieces are working together like a machine, a well-oiled machine, and on the other hand, Donald Byrne's pieces are very far from each other. Queen sitting over here, can't do anything by herself. The knight, again, is still pretty far away from the action. It would take a while for her to come, maybe come to D, come here, here, maybe afflict some kind of threat that way. So, um, Donald Byrne tries something else at this point. It goes H4. Again, the idea is here: if we can get to H5 and try to force an ex try to force an ex uh, like a capture here, maybe then his queen can take advantage of its mobility to try and deliver a series of checks on the black king. Maybe at least he can go for a draw that way. Fisher sh uh, he shuts this down at once. He goes H5. So now that's not going to happen. And now we see knight e5. Like we talked about trying to get this knight into the action to see if he can do something here at least to give some kind of attack. We see king g7 now. So here Bobby Fisher realizes that his bishop's been pinned for way too long. He says, all right, I'm going to go king g7. And now this bishop is now free to pursue its own evil goals. And now we see king g1. Again, so the, the idea there between behind king g1 is that the, the incoming threat for black is bishop d6 which would pin this knight on e on e5 and also attack the queen on uh, on b8. And there's just no way, no good way to really defend against that. So he at least says, all right, let's get the king away to g1. So at least the knight is not pinned anymore if that happens. And now we see bishop c5 check. Now is really the beginning of the end for this game here. So bishop c5 check. Uh, now the king goes to f f1, but it could also go to h2. That's what uh, Stockfish recommends as the best move here. If you go to king h2, though, you have a beautiful move, bishop d6, again, attacking both the knight and the uh, and the queen here. And there's just not a lot you can do with this position. So if you go, if you try something like queen e8 to try and defend the knight, then you have a really si a silent but deadly move that's rook to a1. And what this does, is it puts white in sort of a, a zigzag position, where any move that he makes is just going to basically destroy what semblance of defense he has in holding on to this position because well the queen can't move because if the queen moves anywhere it's either going to get taken or it will stop defending the knight so if you go say like queen d8 then the knight is going to fall if you move the king to h3 then rook h1 is just going to be checkmate on the spot so he'd have to do something like i don't know like g4 for example um, and then you just have this rook a2 check if the king goes back to the first rank again you know you, can, you have knight g3 check things like that if he goes h3, then you have actually a really nice combination here. If you have, if you go h takes on g4, now if the king takes, then you have this fork and you win the queen immediately. If the knight takes, you have a really beautiful combination here. Rook h2 checks, sacrificing the rook. So knight has to capture, no other option, because the bishop is defending here. And then knight f2 is a really, really beautiful checkmate. So this, this bishop guards here, this bishop guards here, and the knight controls the g4 square. So it's a beautiful, beautiful checkmate that would arise if that happened. So that's so that's why king h2 doesn't really st stop anything, even though the computer rates it as the best move. Uh, king f1 is what was actually played. Then again, we just, Bobby Fischer at this point, he's just marching the king down the execute, making the king walk the plank, if you will, just marching him down the execution line with knight g3 check. King has no option but to go to e1. We have bishop b4 check. Again, just pushing the king down the line. King d1, bishop b b3 check. King c1, knight d2 check, king b1, knight c3 check, king c1, and now there's two options for checkmate here. You have either bishop a3 checkmate, or you can do what Bobby Fischer actually played in the game, rook c2 checkmate. So it's an absolutely gorgeous game here. Um, it's one of my favorites of all time. I've seen several different people analyze it over the years. I have also tried analyzing my, this myself countless times. And each time I feel like I look at this game, I see something new and exciting. And it's just a beautiful game and testament to just how strong of a player Bobby Fischer was. And again, bear in mind, this game was played when he was only 13 years old. Another thing I just wanted to say is it's it was a really nice gesture of Donald Byrne to actually let this game go all the way to checkmate. A lot of, uh, especially at the higher levels, a lot of chess players will just resign when they, see, when they can see the writing on the wall. So for example, like as far back as maybe even something like this, you might see a resignation. So real credit to Donald Byrne actually like, you know, going this far to let Bobby Fischer have his moment. Um, it was really a gentlemanly gesture on his part as well. Um, but yeah, I just hope you enjoyed this game. Really, really gorgeous game. It was, um, it kind of inspired me to try to, to try and, you know, be more inventive in the way I play chess. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this analysis as well. Please do let me know if there's any other 
chess analysis videos you'd like me to make. I got some really good feedback on my previous one, so I figured I'd try and make another one. If there's any games you'd like me to analyze, please send me a, leave me a comment. If you enjoyed this video, please do like it, share it with your friends. And yeah, I will see you guys later with another video. I hope this was helpful.